the pulpit of the Abbot in alchemy as being the child of the sun and moon. So that we have a basic triad established here of the sun, the moon, and the master. A triad which is in many esoteric systems. We know that the sun represents in the alchemy the spiritual source or father of all things. The moon, the mysterious mother, or the mother of mysteries, great Diana, goddess of the Ephesians. We know therefore that heaven and earth, or God and nature, father and mother, sun and moon, generate the father of the child in conformity with the concept of the 47th proposition of Euclid. If therefore the other is the child of the sun and moon, we know rather well the symbolism and the place would be occupied in the trying nature of man as he was studied and considered by ancient philosophy. We know that spirit and matter in their new wings and bending, produce the mysterious power which the Greeks term the soul. But the adept is therefore the diamond soul, as in the symbolism of Northern Buddhism. But he represents the power of the soul as the great transmuting agent in the universe. What then is the alchemical concept of soul? How are we to understand it? And how does this understanding differ from the more popular systems that we know today? It is obvious to the students of the medic arts that the soul represents a compound. But it represents the combining or uniting of two qualities in themselves not to be combined or united except through some catalyzing agent. Spirit and matter in themselves are not easily brought into a compound. So the alchemist is told that the secret of his art is to make fire burn in water, and that water must feed the flame. Now we realize now in the midst that fire and water now play the part of the king and queen, or the heaven and earth. And that fire must be sustained by water, yet in our common experience, water extinguishes fire. So we are dealing not with the creed and rude elements that we know, but with certain mystical symbols, allegories based in chemistry, but extending far beyond our normal chemical speculation. The soul being a compound is combining two forces or two principles or two qualities. It represents a union of archetype and matter to produce what we call form. Therefore, within the pattern of soul lies the concept of the world form. For form must always be a compound. Form contains a compound of life and matter. It is life brought into organization through matter. It is life implanting itself or impressing itself as what Bernie calls the signatura realum upon the face of matter. Whenever life builds its forms and bodies, we have this formal principle. Bodies composed of matter 
bound together by life and formed as an installed matter. It is the compound of life and substance. Thus the soul has a dual nature, part of its nature representing an extension downward from the sphere of life or consciousness, and part of its nature being an extension upward from the world of bodies, from the world of matter. Thus in the great uh, apocryphal book of Enoch, we hear the story of the sons of heaven descending to the daughters of men and taking them for wives, and the progeny were giants, and there were giants upon the earth in those days. Now the sons of God and the daughters of men are again spirits and bodies. The union of the principle of life brought into identity with the principle of matter. And these two combining to create organizations, organisms, compound creatures. And of this compounding, the most basic, according to the Greek, was this compound which is called the soul. Either the world soul, which is the compound of heaven and earth, or the human soul, which is the compound of consciousness and matter. In alchemy, therefore, the soul becomes the great laboratory within which the experimentation takes place. And the problem in regeneration in alchemy is to solve the mystery of the soul, to transform its present state into that of the diamond or adept soul. The soul we recognize as containing within it two essential elements. One, the emotional or psychic nature, the other, the mental or rational nature. We know that reason and emotion represent the sum and mood on the level of the soul. And that these two again must unite to produce a new instrument or a new being, which we have mentioned already and have said was the alchemical homunculus or the artificially created being. We have also learned that in the development of the nature of soul in alchemy, the soul becomes the instrument of function upon a level of being which is infinitely more subtle and refined than that of our objective life. To the alchemist, therefore, the mystery of the soul, its creation, its unfoldment, its development, was uh, this mystery was carefully concealed under a series of chemical formulas. And each disciple was expected and presumed to be able ultimately to solve these formulas. Each was a reader to which he must give his own internal meditation. It was a symbol upon which he must contemplate and through which he must release his own instinctive apperception of these mysteries of life. <coughs> then let us try to analyze the process is creating the soul. And why man peculiarly endowed with this instrument has a destiny unique among the created things of the earth and of nature. <coughs> to understand this, we must borrow something from the later Egyptian religion. That phase of it which developed under the fleet burials of Egypt, the Ptolemies where the mysteries and rituals of the earlier religions were brought under certain philosophical disciplines from Greece and thereby made more intelligible to us. In the Egyptian mystery, the soul was a secondary structure consisting of seven essential internal ingredients. These in themselves the Egyptians call the seven souls. 
And to each of these souls was given one of the great psychic behavior problems of human experience and consciousness. Man's soul was formed within. But he had what might be termed his milk soul or his infant soul. They had one duty to perform. Later, this soul gave way to a second. More correctly, the soul itself unfolded and became a second kind of soul, which had to do with the extension and expansion of his body and the principle of growth, the unfoldment from within itself, the extension of his cycle nervous system throughout the fabric of his body. The gradual control of body by the power within it. Later, this gave way to the third soul, which was the generative soul, which, taking hold at puberty or adolescence, began the process of setting into motion the great reproductive power of soul energy. And so it proceeded, step by step, to these and other forms until it finally came to the adept soul or the highest part of man's psychical life. And this soul also, having absorbed the other six, became the sovereign and complete ruler over the individual. And if this soul was protected during life, this individual then had a consciousness after death and received a conscious place in immortality. This, then, was not the soul that finished and must die, but the soul that could go on to the abode of the God in the blessed land of Amenta. So the soul of man was something he had to earn, something he had to create or build by his own activity. And this soul manifested to him through the unfoldment of his own inner life. The maturing of his soul was his great work. And having reached the maturity of the body, growth must go on. And the person in the body must grow, must unfold its own potential and achieve its own complete identity. When it did so, the soul then became, more or less, the vehicle of the self. And the individual stepping across from body took up his natural and proper abode within the structure of his own soul. He was then what the Egyptians called a blessed soul, one established in the lasting. And having achieved then to the adept state. In a way, this is the same concept that underlies the concept of the Hindu Mahatma. For Mahatma simply means great soul a being in whom this internal power has accomplished its transmutation or its wonderful work. In Christianity, the messianic soul is represented by the avatar or the system. And this is the Christ in you, which is the hope of glory, in which if it be lifted up, will raise all things unto it. Thus, the death and resurrection of the Messiah represents the soul cycle, or the death and resurrection of the life, or the life, or as it would be termed in alchemy, the death and restoration of the man. The soul then becomes the seed or theater of the great regenerative power of man, and it is composed by the release of these two polarized extremes of consciousness. One of the releases is achieved from below <coughs> by the building of what we call the personality. And the personality, when properly and naturally matured, makes its positive contribution to the psychic and soul life of the individual. Through the building and integration of the personality, we achieve, therefore, one of the essential elements of the soul. We become masters of the working of salt. <coughs> For salt represents, in alchemy, uh, the power of experience, 
of the growth of man from below upward. The growth of his lower nature, we will say, the unfoldment of it toward the light of truth. Now the lower nature of man ascends gradually through the physical, through the emotional and mental life, until finally it reaches the apex of its own achievement on the level of reason. Therefore, from below upward, man builds gradually the rational power, the <coughs> rational faculties of his own nature. At the same time, the universality at the source of man builds downward, uh, creating step by step man's overtones or spiritual values, which gradually descending through the great powers of created society, <coughs> have their final manifestation in the mingling of the upper and lower triangle, the triangle of man's growth from below and the inverted triangle of man's descent, these two meeting in their empathy, uh, form this mysterious figure that resembles an hourglass. Well, which Father Time carries on again in the alchemical reader. Thus from above, or from the internal spiritual life of man, one force flows. From below, from the external material life of man, another force flows. These two forces meet, meeting in the form of salt and sulfur. And the meaning and the meeting of these two makes possible the birth of the homunculus. Yet this in itself cannot occur except with the presence of the aid of the third of androgen elements, which is mercury. And mercury is a very powerful catalytic agent in alchemy. It makes possible the building or binding of the two principles. Now, let's try to understand this a little bit on the level of philosophy, so that we can follow the alchemical symbolism more easily. <laughs> Man consists in the esoteric systems of antiquity of three essential natures. One is termed spirit, one is termed soul, the other is termed body. These three constitute a triad of conditions. They are represented in the universe by the great theological triad of heaven, earth, and hell. And they are represented wherever symbolism arises as a threefold division of existence. A division which consists of a superior part and an inferior part and a middle region between. In the Nordic religion, of uh, the Gothic rites of Germany and the Organic rites of Scandinavia, the dreadful tree, or the tree of the universe, is very much key to this symbol. At the root of the tree is down in the darkness of Penheim, where the serpents of oblivion are forever gnawing at truth. The other part of the tree extends to the highest of all the gods in Asgard. And here the spirit dwells, a man who is seated upon his great throne looks down upon the world. In the middle distance between the world of darkness below and the world of light above is Midgard, the abode of mortals. And here upon a flat plate like surface in the old Gothic concept, was the world surface as we see it, with mountains and rivers and continents. And here all the races of human beings dwelt, suspended or supported upon the branches of this great tree, twixt heaven and earth, or twixt the above and the below, between spirit and matter, ruling over all things. Thus humanity collectively is emblematic of the world soul. The human being is upon the level of the world soul development. And mankind is therefore the personification of the principle of soul. He is composed therefore of an 
animal nature which is less than soul, and that there is a divine nature that is more than soul. And between these, he has his existence, partaking of both, and possessing within himself the power of extending his own consciousness above or below the medium line upon which he exists. Thus the individual, as the Greek pointed out, may verge by inclination downward. And when the focal point of consciousness descends in the direction of body, the result is a material. Or an individual becomes more and more completely immersed in matter or in material things. He was like Narcissus, who seeing his own reflection in the pool, hastened to embrace his likeness and falling into the pool with drowned. Thus the soul of man, seeking its own likeness in matter, rushes toward it, and in that way descends into the mystery of generation and becomes possessed and obsessed by bodies. Plato gives us a very good description of this experience. On the other hand, man is capable by a positive expansion of himself, of ascending above the visual level of soul and approaching a spiritual state. He thereby, through his aspiration, through the unfoldment of his own spiritual nature, becomes an idealist rather than a materialist. And by his ideals, he verges toward reality. Yet man, if he descends, may not remain constantly upon this lower level, because he is superior to it, and must inevitably drift back to his true place. Likewise, if he ascends above the level of his own integration, he may not be able to maintain this elevation, but falls back again into his own place. But man has a certain aura, a certain field of extension, either upward or downward, by which he can actually experience something of the divine and something of the base, something that is better than he is, something that is worse than he is. So he occupies this middle distance and is the actual embodiment of the power of soul itself. The alchemist conceives the soul to be composed of the seven metals, and therefore, in symbolism, working with the soul involves the transformation of these metals, the power of releasing from the metals their soul energy or power. For as alchemist points out, when you are working with material medicine, you must work with material elements. But when you are seeking to remedy the sickness of the soul, you must work not with the bodies of the minerals and metals, but with their souls, or the energies which are lost within them. Thus it is not with growth of food metals that we shall correct the deficiencies of the soul. We must therefore have a special and refined metal, which we have passed through certain regeneration. Now there is an old figure of uh, the seven arts and sciences, or the seven metals, in which we find the metals identified with the arts and sciences, one with logic, another with rhetoric, one with mathematics, and so on. We then come to the realization that the seven liberal arts and sciences contain within themselves the keys to the transformation of the soul. Man has a body of learning, whether it be astronomy, mathematics, music, architecture, all of these subjects. And these seven arts and sciences arise because of soul. They are originate in soul. They are vitalized into their own existence by the energy of soul. They belong to the level of soul. If they are debased, they become material arts and sciences. If they are spiritual, uh, spiritualized, they become divine arts and sciences. But both of these are extensions, one built downward and the other upward. The natural state of the arts and sciences being on the level of the soul itself. 
Therefore, we know today the problem is to discover through art the means of releasing through the arts and sciences the mysterious soul powers which they possess. These releases correspond very, very closely with your yogic discipline. They correspond with all of your ancient mystical rites. Because these are the arts and sciences is the outer vestment of a mystery. The individual who is willing and who is able to accept only the material forms of these things becomes really upon the level of the mind and body only. But those who seek the mystery of the metal, who seek the mystery of the soul locked in them, will find that each art and science contains within it a secret remedy for the efficiency of the soul power. <coughs> Thus alchemy begins the process of transmuting knowledge, transmuting learning from the material to its own level. How are we then to understand the soul power locked within an art or science? Well, let us take one of these arts and sciences for the moment. We know that the Dionysians took architecture and revealed the mystery that was concealed within its symbolism. But as far as they instance, music. To see what music means, because it belongs to the mystery of the soul. Music is a soul art. It is an art which is capable of revealing to man more of the constitution of his own psychic nature. It was obvious to recognize that the lute or the lyre could be used to represent the entire mystery of soul power. He therefore created the instrument upon which he could play certain enchanted melodies. He learned the power of music. And in India, uh, and in China, the esoteric arts of music have been long considered and studied. By degrees, through the knowledge of music, through the application of its principles, man can come to a clear and concise understanding of the nature of his own inner psychic life. Music becomes not only a key to interpret the soul, but it becomes a powerful instrument for the expression of the soul and its powers and energy. Thus, each of the arts and sciences becomes one of the dimensions of the soul release project, and in turn gives man one of the facets or keys to his own understanding of soul life. Man being naturally a soul, living upon the level of soul. It means that he is suspended in his own existence between the spiritual and the material extremes. And therefore he must advance upon this uh, narrow path which divides him from the universe of causes above and the universe of effects below. He straddles these like the Colossus of Rhodes, or like the ancient man of the Kabbalah, with one foot upon the earth and the other upon the sea. And wherever the alchemical symbolism arises, we see the repetition of these figures. Now, if we go into mysticism, alchemist, alchemist, alchemical mysticism, we come upon the symbol of the diamond soul, or the perfect soul, which in the Christian mysticism was regarded as the proper figure of Christ. Christ, therefore, is the adept soul. It is the protective, redeeming soul within man. It is the soul that dies in man for man and is reborn through man by the resurrection of the soul in man. Then he says the soul in man is planted like a seed and that all things in nature possess within them the seeds of soul and the seed seeds of the soul power can be caused to grow, and by the fertilizing of these seeds and their growth and the constant tending of them by the wise God, the old promise, the seed souls will grow and will bear their fruit, and this fruit will be for the healing of all other nations and for all that suffers. Now Cronus, the one-legged gardener, of course, is the keeper of the tree of life, and he represents time 
and do the time which makes all things come to their natural growth and harvest. Therefore, all things that are ordained are perfected by time and are under the guardianship of time and are fulfilled in time. A man's soul, which has an origin in time, is peculiarly, peculiarly under the domination of this dimension of the world. We know psychologically what we mean by the soul. We know from the standpoint of Freudian analysis, or Jungian analysis, that we regard the soul as a kind of internal person. The ancient saw it as more than that, very much more than that. Although they would not refute much of what has been done since. They would demand that the whole thought be extended very much further. Let us then try to understand, without going into too many side uh, issues, something of the situation with which we are, uh, are primarily concerned at the moment. Let us say that we will first analyze the principles of Salva, Saul, and Mercury. Salva, we now know to be the sun, which is the Father life. The Son is universal being, universal reality, universal life. The Son also is the seat or ground of cosmic consciousness. It is the cause and source of reality. It is reality. It is being. It is actuality. It is universal existence, forever existing, and forever full of life, forever germinal or seminal, filled with peace, forever bestowing itself. On the level of man's experience, this becomes his spiritual nature. And he conceives of a spiritual entity nourished and sustained by this spiritual life of the universe. And he therefore accepts the king both as spirit and as God, and makes the king the administrator of all the laws, principles of nature, and the source of all concepts of divinity, the one, the beautiful, and the good. This being is total and complete life. Light not of the physical world, but of the inner world. The light of the fullness of spiritual grace in all matters. This is then sulfur, which is the fire that sustains itself forever, and is the principle of fire in all things. This is the source of the fire of aspiration. This is the source of the ever-burning lamp and the altar fire that never fails. It is a symbol of the spiritual identity, the spiritual interior of everything that exists. In Salt, we must remember, is associated with the tragedy of Locke's wife, who turned back and was turned into a pillar of salt. <coughs> salt is the symbol of crystallization. Salt then tells us the story of body. It tells us the story of matter. It tells us that the extreme polar opposite of absolute life is relative privation of life. Because the alchemist did not believe that there could be a place anywhere which is totally devoid of life. <coughs> Thus, the greater degree of life is sulfur, and the least conceivable degree of life is salt. He turns it on the moral plane where the philosopher of old said that evil is the least degree of good. Therefore, salt is the least degree of sulfur. The salt must consume salt. Because in this universe, there is no part of it in which reality does not have an existence. But in sulfur, we have the total expression of reality. And in salt, we have the failure, the total failure of expression of reality. 
as the alchemist says, sulfur sleeps in the salt. It dies in the salt. The universal consciousness dies in matter. It is obliterated by the fact of matter. It works within matter. For what is matter finally but infinite life expressing uh, through certain qualities, through certain attributes. Yet this life we do not comprehend as life, but regard as the antithesis of life. Therefore, spirit and its antithesis are sulfur and salt. Now in the beginning, according to the opening chapters of Genesis, uh, God created the heavens of the earth. He caused to emerge from his own nature the two great principles, the king and queen, the sulfur and salt. And the salt, or the abyss, was without shape and void. And this power which was creating divided the firmament and placed part of the firmament above and part below. And he divided the deep from the deep. And in this process of causing this division to occur, we can use another very interesting alchemical device. In one of the early books of the great alchemist Landsberg, we have a scene which shows the king or the supreme power moving in a whirlwind over the face of the deep. And we find the great abyss lying spread out below, and we have the sea of the, of the power of God moving above and the great depth below. And the waters which were above the firmament were divided from the waters which were beneath the firmament. And the waters beneath the firmament were ocean. And the waters above the firmament were Shemayim, the water of life. And in the midst of these powers, in the midst of this great division that took place, there suddenly emerged the grand form of Elohim, the Creator. And the Elohim, or the builders, the seven powers, <coughs> shooting out from the mystery of the world, are suspended between heaven and earth. <coughs> and here the seven powers gather together the form of the world causing it to arise between the this and the abyss, causing it to exist between time and eternity, and fashioning it magnificently from the abstract principle of sulfur and salt. And the seven powers which bring forth the creation, the Elohim, the bowels of the sacred word, are represented in the book of Landsbury by Mercury, the ancient the great power of the Cadillac, the winged being, the messenger from heaven to earth and from earth to heaven, who carrying his mysterious rod round with the serpent, brings forth from the below the shadow of the world form and unites it above with the descending hierarchy of the world spirit. So between these two extremes of Ether and chaos, time and eternity, being and not being. And out of the great uh, darkness that they will call the Indus comes forth the mystery. The mystery of the primary and primordial generation. And this power, this mystery which came forth is the world soul. Described by the Greek office as things with many heads, bearing all manner of likenesses and breaking through the age of time, born from the age which is made by the words of ether and chaos. All these symbols go right back to the same major principle, namely that the ancients recognized <coughs> that existence was the result of the striving of polarities or of opposite beings. And Einstein would come to practically the same concept. That life and life as we know it are the friction of the motions, the qualitative motions of basic energy. 
not the quantitative, but the qualitative hope. And that these bring forth the revealed form of things out of the great abyss, out of the great darkness. This is the meaning of the Hindu concept that these creations came as the result of will and yoga. The duality produces between itself a being in which its own attributes are present. And this being is called the soul. The universal soul, fashioned in the womb of chaos. And this soul becomes the basis of the creation of the human soul, which in turn is the child of striving, the progeny of the mingling of heaven and earth, of time and eternity, of being and not being. The soul of man is engendered by being and not being, by realization and ignorance, uh, by experience and intuition, by reason and love, and by the meanings of all the opposites which go forth into this vast psychic container from which will be born the radiant form of the deity baby, bursting from the egg and taking power and supremacy over the dark field of mystery in which it was created or conceived. Soul, therefore, represents the objectification of spirit and matter, brought together as a being. And all things that emerge in the middle distances of man's experience are therefore distinctly related to soul itself. Now in the further development of this same allegory, we have Adam introduced as a being into which uh, the breath of life was breathed. Now if we go back into the ancient Kabbalistic legends about Adam, we find that Adam's body was composed of the seven planets, that each one of the great powers of space bestowed an attribute upon it. And each of these in turn gave a traitor to Adam, so that when he became a living thing, Adam contained within himself the seven souls. And at that time it was also conceived that he was androgynous, male-female, in two forms united back to back, and that the Lord of the Elohim cut them asunder and made the male-female being into a male and female being. Here again, it is a definite allegory about the soul. For the soul itself is essentially an androgynous being. We have a, a story which we told you about some time ago in connection with Balzac's story of Serafina Serafina, <coughs> in which we have again this allegory of the soul. This particular treatment developed according to the philosophy of Sarah Sweetenborg. So uh, in the alchemical, to return to it once more, we have the union of the uh, life and chaos of time and eternity within a bubble. We have the miniature replica of all that has been done, taking place within the soul of the human being himself, the alchemical resource. And in the study of this mystery, we find that man recapitulates by a series of renovations or a series of augmentations as they are termed in chemistry. The history and generation of his world, the formation of his own nature and being, and the final release of his own soul. Now as the soul is composed of the strivings of spirit and matter, it is bound into this artificial compound by the magic wand of her <laughs> it becomes essential to our subject to try to understand more about the reasons uh, for its existence and the ultimate end for which it is intended. The reason why the soul has to have an existence is because man himself is actually a soul being. He is therefore a soul being without a body on the level of his own nature. This is due to the emblematic or symbolic fall 
So by the fall, a soul fell into a body. And because of this situation, it lost identity or orientation in its own nature. As man now lives in a physical body, it was the opinion of the alchemist that he lives in exile. He is in a kind of underworld. And this physical body can never be his home and can never be his natural abode. He lives in this as a same tenant, as a condition of insufficiency and insecurity. Because the being within the body is not content. The individual is not able to be completely a body because he possesses attributes and qualities which do not belong to body. <coughs> they belong to a higher level of existence than that which man at present experiences. Yet man is not by nature capable of becoming a spirit and of ascending into the abode of eternal blessings. He is yet imperfect in many ways, and in need of great experience and wisdom. But he has a home that is proper to him. And that home is a different kind of body, a body real but invisible, a body which contains within it the archetypal forms of all physical things, but is much more subtle, much more sufficient to him than the form which he now occupies. In the alchemical symbolism of the early Jewish alchemists, the fall of man is exiled from paradise, and all these things are brought into the chemical symbolism. Because it is assumed that man is a wanderer, a stranger in body, that as long as he remains completely in body, he remains in a state inferior to his natural destiny. Therefore, as his growth proceeds, as he advances in the unfoldment of his own nature, he begins to build a new body within himself, a body which originates within his own heart, for the heart is the womb of the second body. And in this heart is born with him, within him, the concept of a superior state. <coughs> a concept of a life apart from body. A life not an immortality after death, but a functioning existence. A man has lived a long time, and his race has existed a long time. And just to show that man through his achievements has built a complex material culture that is passed on from generation to generation. So through his inner experience, he has propagated the soul. This soul goes on and grows from generation to generation, thus as the outer civilization increases. Therefore, the individual born into the world today is not born soulless. He is born as a compound of mind, soul, body, spirit. And within him is this unfinished soul which is like the unfinished temple of Solomon the King, which is the temple of his own inner life. He therefore has a certain sharing or participating in soul, a sharing which is greater than that of the aboriginal world. He has greater soul power than the savage. He has greater soul maturity than the barbarian. Yet he has not yet accomplished the magnum opus. He has not perfected the soul body. So as he grows up in his material life today, he grows up as a partial soul within a body. This partial soul has its dreams and its hopes and its aspirations, but it also has its limitations. It has its imaginative and creative faculties, but it is also bound by appetites and illusions to the material life around it. So each individual inherits an unfinished soul. And the completion of this soul must be left to one of two things, either to the keeping of old father from us, which is time, which means that in the fullness of time, nature will perfect the soul of man, even as it perfects the diamond in the coal. But alchemy says, nature 
and his own past and his own way, but man may perfect art and with art perfect nature. And it is possible for man by the serious and a contrite application of that which he knows to be true, it is possible for him to anticipate and then augment, increase the processes of growth within himself, so that he may advance the state of his own soul, that he may gradually approach the adept state of soul power. To do this is not to depart from nature, but to aid it and to assist the man himself in the perfection of his own inner life, which is rooted within the nature of his soul. To do this again requires a great art, a great discipline, a great science of human regeneration. And under the name of alchemy was concealed this mystical art, this mystical science by which man might approach the actual the completion of his own soul life. Now the beginning of this transformation or transmutation was then the study of chemistry. As the alchemist was told, it's very simple. The first thing you have to find are pure elements. So the alchemist was told that he must have some way of, of securing his basic material upon which the experiments in the laboratory depended. He had to find a very definite and particular kind of salt. And this is the salt of the earth. This is the same kind of salt that was referred to in the biblical story. The ye are the salt of the earth. Now how to find this salt? And the one school of alchemy, there were several, one school of alchemy says that the only way to secure this basic material was from you. Therefore, what you had to do was to go out at night in certain regions where the dew was heavy. And you were to place glass plates raised from the ground and insulated. Uh, by wood or some non-conducting substance so that they would not ground or would not be charged by magnetic fields. And you were to collect upon the surface of these plates do, and you were to catch it or place it in vessels carefully uh, prepared for this purpose, absolutely clean and capable of being completely and hermetically sealed. Now this might sound like a difficult experiment, and yet I've known a number of practicing alchemists today who have succeeded right here in the mountains back of San Bernardino. Some of these alchemists have been able to collect as much as 10 or 20 gallons to do off a glass plate. It is not an impossible thing to do. Because they believe in the alchemical tradition that this do a heaven held within itself certain powers captured from the rays of the stars. Also that this dew, having never touched the earth, was like the dewy mistletoe that had to be cut from the tree without being permitted to touch the earth or have lost its power. That this dew could then be passed through certain experimentation by which the powers within it the occult virtue of the planet could be augmented and increased. So I know one of you run a sad experiment more than that particular uh, rather disagreeable procedure also. I know one at least one case in which a five gallon bottle exploded. <coughs> and there was actually with the the dew a sufficient fermentation taking place to cause a tremendous combustion and pressure. Now all of this belongs to the physical story of alchemy. But all of the alchemists were told that the great problem in the first solve was to secure pure elements for the preparation of his work. He was told when truth that he had to have pure copper. Not the copper you could buy 
even in the laboratory or in the chemist shop. But pure copper, which could only be found under certain conditions and in certain places. Pure silver, pure gold, pure mercury. But these various elements had to be pure, pure beyond any knowledge that we had of them. Well, the implication as you go through the story is rather obvious. The beginning of the great transmutation was to find the pure forms of the basic emotions, instincts, and appetites, and attitudes of the human being. We had to find, for example, not just copper, but pure love. We had to find not just silver, but pure imagination. We had to find not zinc, but pure reason. Because each one of these elements was tied to a substance and to a planet and to a power in nature. Each one of these basic principles had to be pure. So we begin with an elaborate series of purifications which are nothing more or less than a restatement of what were called the cathartic disciplines of um, classical philosophy. The individual looking for these pure elements uh, could only hope to find them within himself. In the beginning of his art was the discovery of the purity of his own basic soul power. He had to purify and the energies of the soul, which he must use in the accomplishment of the great experiment. Thus was the problem presented to him that in all probabilities he would not be able to find these hours in an absolutely pure state. Consequently, his first duty after he had discovered elements suitable to his purpose was the continuance of the process of purification by fire. And that the living principle would be carried across through the resource and collected again through a process of distillation. Therefore, that the purification consisted of cycles of distillation. That these elements had to be completely distilled again and again until finally all growth, all growth matter, all impurity would be left behind. Therefore, the bodies of these uh, minerals and metals would die, because the bodies of them could never be united anyway. There is no union to be achieved on the level of matter. Therefore, it is only when all of these are again reduced to their full equivalent, becoming invisible like the soul itself, but captured within the disciplines of consciousness, the resource, that they can be reunited to form the basic ingredients of the soul. Let's put that then onto another level of language and try to see what we are working with. Man experiencing his own emotions and experiencing his own thoughts is not wrong in realizing that they are not of a sufficient quality to sustain his natural spiritual aspirations. He must therefore go through the process of regenerating the various instincts, attitudes, appetites which he possesses, refining them for the release of their soul content. Let's take one for example, which will more or less convey the problem that we have in a very simple way. Here is an individual, a person, who wishes to grow. But this individual is by nature jealous. Now we might say that jealousy is an emotion which is under some conditions almost apparently justifiable. There are moments when it is exceedingly difficult for an individual not to express this very natural instinct. And yet jealousy is an emotional pressure. Jealousy can only exist because man has a soul. 
The bees and the birds are not God. The universe beyond man is not God. Jealousy belongs to the soul complex in man. Therefore, it is a negative expression of soul energy. Now, we may say that jealousy is almost necessary to the human being and that he is justified in preserving this faculty and in attempting to grow and develop and be good in spite of it. But here is the difficulty you are confronted with. The stone, which is the perfect soul, can never be cast if any of its elements are absent. And the elements of the soul must be created out of the purification of its own attributes. If jealousy remains, the soul can never be cast as the soul, because this would then become the flaw in the diamond. It would be a quality unregenerated or unredeemed, and therefore a stone not suitable to be built into the everlasting house. That particular stone had not been true. Therefore it would not fit into the wall, and if it was taken to the wall, it would weaken the wall. In the alchemical symbolism, therefore, every one of the extensions of soul represented by the minerals and metals must be redeemed in itself before it can be mixed into the great compound of the molten sea. And the individual working with his alchemy, therefore, experiences within himself many emotions and things. Fear, doubt, grief, pride, anxiety, worry, hate criticism, condemnation, bigotry, prejudice. All of these are soul faculties to its basic elements. Knowledge and its effect upon man must be broken down. It must all be brought to a condition of calcination. Every idea the human being has must be tried by fire and its growth must be burned away. <coughs> To accomplish this is a great task, They're exciting the most earnest endeavors of the most thoughtful, conscientious, and courageous person. But by alchemy, gradually, all of these elements are reduced. <laughs> and we have a very dissimilar state in other schools of mystical thinking. We have, for example, uh, the Eastern system, where under the guru concept of instruction, the disciple is taught to unlearn what he has previously known, is taught to discipline himself against any extremes or intensities of his own disposition, and is finally shown how, through this complete regeneration of himself, to approach to the universal which lies beyond it. This is precisely the same implication as in the story of Alfred. Now having assumed for the moment that we have a grasp of the problem of basic elements, now we must pass on to the next degree of the art of the soul. Actually, what the alchemist is attempting to produce here is not immediately the transformation of his own totality but the production of the agent of this transformation. And this agent is the red lion. Now the red lion, of course, is another solar or sun symbol. But it is a most particularly an alchemical device. <coughs> it, is made, it is the name given to the final formula and its production. Now in alchemy, when all of the elements and all the ingredients are brought together in an exactly perfect manner, and the experiment with all its rotations is carried through to the end, uh, the adept achieves what is called a powder of projection. This is a small amount of an incredibly powerful agent. 
Uh, Paracelsus is said to have carried a small amount of his agent in the hilt of his sword. After it was laid for him and presented to him by the adepts of alchemy in Constantinople. <coughs> the purpose of this agent is that it becomes universal in its application. It can perform any and all mysteries. One grain of this powder cast upon base metals will transmute 200,000 times its own weight into pure gold. One grain of this powder dissolved in wine will become the universal medicine and will keep the individual in the same condition of life forever. One grain of this mysterious powder <coughs> If incorporated with certain ingredients and accepted into the system under a certain type of method, can produce all knowing and the power uh, to read every secret locked in nature. Here is the diamond soul, the diamond stone. Here is the elixir of life. Here is the universal medicine. Here is the absolute transmuting agent. This mysterious powder called the red lion. And the red lion is fashioned out of the complete agreement of the metals, in which all, having been reduced to their essential principle, they are fused together by one tremendous experiment. And out of that complete fusing, under terrific heat and combustion, yet in a completely sealed vessel, which must not leak or in any way weaken, <coughs> under a strange and wonderful procedure, which appears as a miniature of the complete forming of the universe, the alchemist watching his report, sees cosmos emerge from chaos, sees the ordering of all life, beholds the thunders of heaven and the rumbles of the underworld, sees lightning flashes and creatures appear and disappear within the vessel, and finally comes the great quietude that follows all this tremendous combustion, and that which is in the bottom of the vessel when it is finished is this wonderful radiant mass shimmering, shining like the treasure of the rainbow, a mysterious and priceless tincture which can become the complete the mystery of universal power. What are we dealing with? What is the story? What is it that can transmute this tremendous mass of anything into true gold? Under the complete story of the casting of the stone, there's only one possible allegory that we can conceive of. The story taking place in the laboratory bottle is identical with the wonderful description given in the Eastern scriptures of the illumination of Buddha. <coughs> the magnificent experience, which is the complete recapitulation of the spiritual life of man, is illumination itself. It is the achievement of universal consciousness. Therefore, consciousness in its universal state is the mysterious outer projection. This is the red light. For one grain of it can transform a hundred thousand times its own weight of error into pure truth. Wherever it is turned, whatever it is done, when it's done with it, it achieves the perfection of the great work. Universal consciousness sustains all things, preserves all things, and fulfills all things. Therefore, the true adept possessing the soul is the individual who has achieved universal consciousness within himself. This is his soul. Because from that time on, Everything is transmuted by his own understanding. Everything is transmuted by his own spiritual internal. The 
sin and death vanish from the world because man understands through that. Ignorance is gone forever. So all the problems and burdens of worldliness are transformed into the blessed recognition of truth. So by means of consciousness, truth is revealed in all things. Now says the alchemist, when this problem of uh, projection is placed in the hundred thousand times its own weight of those metals, does it actually transform them? Does it take lead and change it into gold? The alchemist says not in that way. <coughs> He says the reason why lead can be transformed into gold is because the spirit of gold is already present in the lead. You can form no transmutation unless the spirit of the metal you seek is already present under the surface or under the appearance of something else. Therefore, the discovery of truth is not the manufacture of truth, but the recognition of ever-existing truth. Universal consciousness cannot create truth, but it can discover truth and augment it in all things by an alchemical process, revealing truth and making it available as a positive expression of consciousness. In the same way, the alchemist says that he can perpetuate life forever once he possesses the stone. The stone here is universal consciousness assures him of the absolute survival of life. It does not necessarily mean he will live in the same body forever, but having attained the internal enlightenment, there is no darkness possible, and the mystery of death is solved forever. Therefore, everlasting life is bestowed by consciousness itself. Now, all these things uh, remind us to come back again for a moment to this problem of the soul and its part in this particular drama. Universal consciousness in man exists, but is locked away from his visible and knowable consciousness by something. The universal is not a present or present, because in man the personal is immediate and always in the foreground. Thus it follows that the soul, which is the seat of the personality in its present unredeemed state, divides man from the experience of reality. In order that consciousness, as the alchemical mystery, can exist within man, the soul must become the vehicle of that consciousness. And the soul, which is now the channel of desire, must become the vehicle of holy aspiration. Thus it is the fusing and mingling of the elements of the soul producing their own magical and mysterious work that makes possible the revelation of consciousness through soul. And soul becomes the next body above man's present vehicle for the release and expression of soul for our spiritual power. Soul, therefore, is the natural body of consciousness in our and to attain the integration of that soul body is to release consciousness into manifestation and thereby make it available as a basis of the universal medicine and the wise man's soul. In this thinking, we have then another dimension of soul to consider. The messianic soul of the individual is one that has been accepted and believed for great, for great periods of time by the devout of all nations. They have believed that within man is a saving self. This is rather an oriental viewpoint because in the West man is seeking salvation from some source outside of himself. To the Western man salvation is bestowed. Uh, to the Eastern scholar and mystic, salvation is obtained by the direct and conscious and purposeful effort of the self. Thus, in the alchemical tradition which follows the Eastern way, because it probably originated in the East, uh, the alchemist is the truth seeker who must perform his own experiment of regeneration, must find the stone himself. He will be assisted and guided according to his needs and integrity, but he must perform the work. 
And the work of regeneration for each individual must be performed by himself and represent the dedication of his own life and effort to the achievement of the end for which he was originally created and devised, the perfection of his own spiritual vehicles. If man is able to build the soul power within himself, the soul integration, he then releases from above a tremendous inflowing of the spiritual life behind him. The illumined soul becomes the natural instrument of consciousness, and we are capable then of achieving to a Buddhist state, or to participate in the principle uh, which rests in the Buddhist level of, it, of consciousness. The individual must build this soul power himself. He must build this body and release the spiritual mystery through it. Otherwise, this mystery cannot be consummated in him. It cannot be done for him. But he can and does become the adept by the perfection of a soul vehicle suitable for this purpose. Now, this brings us to our symbol in alchemy, which I think uh, we should spend a little thought on because it occurs so frequently and has had so many a crisscross interpretation in its rather interesting descent, and that is the symbol of the rose. Now, in many of the alchemical manuscripts which we have in the fall, the rose symbol occurs. Uh, we almost always think of it as an emblem of the Rosicrucians. Uh, but then again, this is only another name for part of the mystical revival that marked that period in, in uh, European history. The rose occurs frequently in the alchemical bottles. And it also occurs in uh, the symbolism of the troubadours. We find it arising in the stories of Dante and of Petra and of Boccaccio, all of whom were involved in this great revival of the troubadours. The rose, of course, is an acrostic or eros, symbolizing pure love. The rose was also the symbol of secrecy. You will remember that Apuleius, transformed into a donkey by magic, was restored to his human shape when one of the priests of the Eurycinian Mysteries fed him a rose. The rose was also the crest of Mount Luther and occurs in many, many different symbolisms from the time when it is supposed to have grown uh, from the blood of the slain God Adam. <coughs> in the rose garden of Sadi, we find the mystic rose growing within the secret garden of the soul. Here we borrow from the Sufis and the Dervishes, who were also masters of alchemy in their own quiet way. They had many alchemical symbols and made much of these mystical experiments. The alchemical rose growing in a sealed bottle is the same as the rose of Sadi growing in a secret garden. The rose, of course, is again the symbol of the soul plant. The mysterious uh, form of growth which is taking place within the life of the human being. <coughs> In one alchemical symbol, the rose is shown growing out of the dead body of the disciple. The disciple lies dead upon the ground, and the rose is growing out of his heart. In another early symbol associated with the Rosicrucians, the rose is shown growing out of the top of a skull as a symbol of resurrection or the restoration of life. Man living in a material state still has locked within him the flower of his own soul, which is, of course, the rose of Sharon and the lily of the field. Now, in the course of growth, the inner or spiritual life of man is seen growing from the death, <coughs> or from the death head of the skull, as a sign of the spiritual promise of soul power locked within body. Man, man's resurrection from the dead is life growing from death. 
and from his dead materiality, and that this will favor of his material ambitions and purposes, must grow the flower of his own immortality. Each human being has this flower, which is also a symbolical alchemical plant, and occurring in the bottle of the alchemist is again the story of the growth of the mystical love under the warmth of the furnace, the, oh, the warmth of holy aspiration and piety. The robe has many other interesting meanings. It represents, of course, in a way, the heart itself, and in the Rosicrucian emblems of the 18th century, a human heart was placed within the robe, and it also so occurred on some of the diagrams attributed to Gictor. <coughs> All of these symbols tell us definitely that the rose is the soul plant. It is a symbol of the regenerated soul of man. This soul growing out of the body becomes the vehicle of everlastingness or of universal consciousness in man. To bring this thinking down to the level of our own daily living, and trying to, uh, to isolate some part of it that can be made immediately practical for us, let us imagine that we'll all become, for a while at least, philosophic alchemists. We're not going to go into those kinds of experimentations which might result in a sudden explosion in the backyard. We will refrain from that, but we will uh, become philosophical alchemists. And with that thought in mind, what shall we do in order to understand that? I think one of the first things we ought to do, perhaps, is to gain a little knowledge of the literature of this sect, to find out in their own words and thinking what they were trying to do. The second thing that I think we should bear in mind is that these European alchemists lived in a time in which the world was corrupt selfish, chaotic, and that human life was in constant danger. Of course, we live in much more fortunate times than that. <laughs> <laughs> we are just living in a time when we're not sure of <laughs> <laughs> They lived under the fear of the Inquisition. We live under the fear of, of communism or something of that nature. But men live under fear. And let us point out that they will continue to live on this fear by whatever name we call it until the human consciousness becomes greater than fear. Because there will never be a time when little people will not be faced with a problem bigger than themselves. <coughs> when we get through with communism, we get something else. <laughs> because we have to live in the presence of challenge until we meet the challenge. And that we have consistently failed to do through the ages. So the adversary is nothing more or less than the great movie man composed of our own ignorance. And we are frightened out of our wits, not because of the strength of the enemy, but because of the weakness of ourselves. So the alchemist lived in a time when uh, worldly conditions were unfavorable, and in times when his own nature was insufficient to his needs. We live in identically the same kind, kind of time. A few centuries has made no marked difference. Therefore, his position was a very simple one. How can the individual <coughs> gain a sentence over the limitation which binds him? How can he grow? How can he become sufficient to his own internal and eternal need? Until he achieves this, there is no security for him here, and he faces the future with very little hope. Alchemy answered the question very simply. Nature must have the answers to all the secrets of the creatures which she has fashioned. Nature has pointed ways which we have not been wise enough to observe. Nature has sealed her book with seven seals, and on each of the seals she has placed the symbol of an element, a metal, a mineral, a power. And she has locked this book with these seals, and the seven seals of revelation are the seals of the human soul. And man himself must unseal and unlock the mystery of his own inner life. 
The old man goes inside looking for an inner life. He finds it a confused and inadequate one. He finds not peace and security, but further chaos represented by a dragon. He realizes that his inner security has been in some way undermined. That he cannot go directly in and find God. The most that he can hope to find is a cherub with a flaming sword guarding the gate of paradise. He cannot simply go in. Therefore, his only reply to such a challenge as is confronting him is the unnatural and inevitable one. That as he examines his own inner life, he finds that he is under confusion and rooted there. <coughs> he finds that his outer insecurity stems from his inner insecurity. That his inner life is also toxic, is also burdened with prejudices and weaknesses and failures. And that therefore, his great work of regeneration and reorganization must begin where it is needed most within himself. He also knows that uh, it is most unlikely that he will be able to accomplish this regeneration simply by wishing it could happen, or even by hoping, or perhaps by faith or even prayer. He cannot learn to play the piano by prayer, so there is some doubt as to whether he can save his own soul that way. The only solution lies in the recognition that somewhere in nature there must be the secret keys to the art of perfecting nature, because nature itself is an orderly, systematic, wonderful, beautiful, unfolding form of life and, and activity. Therefore, the laws governing this must be available to the individual who will search for them. And there must also be arts and sciences by means of which the regeneration of man is possible. Alchemy then said, any one of the seven arts and sciences must also possess the key to all others. The universe is one great pattern. And the law of governing one part are applicable to all other parts. Therefore, if we can master one art or science to its ultimate degree, we shall be in possession of universal knowledge. For we shall then know how to take that key and apply it to all other knowledge, thus performing a, performing a great transmutation. For we can put this power of projection that we have discovered in alchemy and apply it to all other sciences and transform them also and discover the secret goal which is contained within them. So the Hermetic School took chemistry, involving most of the then known astronomy, astrology, geology, and the degree anthropology, as its field, declaring that there is no place in the universe where the immediate operations of nature can be more easily regulated than in the laboratory of experimentation. Even in science today, the same attitude is generally held. That which is demonstrated in the laboratory, we regard as highly factual. We are also learning from alchemy today that practically every conceivable discovery that man needs for the advancement of his own condition can be developed from a study of chemical reactions. We are mastering little by little mysteries of chemistry that even the alchemists did not know. But he, with one single broad sweep of analogical reasoning, conceived of the fact that there was a key to human regeneration identical with the chemistry of metals and minerals. If therefore he could solve one, he would solve the other. Now, it is the same thing as someone taking up a study today. Let us say that someone decides to study Vedanta, or someone else decides to study Platonism, or another Buddhism. None of these things studied for themselves, and by themselves, and for the sake of learning, 
wherever I'm told no restraint. You can study Platonism or Buddhism for a hundred years and still hold the materialist. You can study all of these things and at best achieve only to a state of philosophical idealism. You can recognize the value and the beauty and the dignity and the wonder of it all and still be exactly the same person you were before. Or very nearly so. Probably you cannot work with any subject indefinitely without a little of it driving off. But you can remain comparatively underprivileged in a world of opportunity. Alchemy, the, the chemist decided the same thing. You would study chemistry from now on. And still, you would only be a gold maker. And uh, living in constant danger of going yourself into the other world by one of his own experiments. The solution did not lie simply <laughs> on this development of the level. But the alchemist, alchemist discovered what the devout Platonists and the true Buddhists discovered. That the amount of learning that he can attain is geared very closely to the amount of acceptance which develops within his own nature. If, in his studies, he is receptive, if he is relaxed, if he makes quiet but natural use of the full endowment of his consciousness and mind, he gradually develops the ability to apperceive certain overtones. It gradually dawns upon him that the outer forms of things are but shells and shadows, and that each one of these processes locks within it a universal truth to be discovered by meditation upon the process, not by acceptance of the process alone. This is what Simon Trismosen told us long ago in the study of alchemy, that by the contemplation of the laws governing chemical experimentation, man suddenly feels within himself the stirring of a creating power. He begins to feel chemistry. He begins to experience the moves of chemistry. And little by little, the bottles and the laboratories and the retorts sort of fade away. And the individual finds himself a magician in a living universe of elements and powers. By degrees, he gains an internal, intuitive insight into the truths behind the facts. And it is only when the truth is released from the fact that it becomes dynamic. The fact is chemistry. The truth is alchemy. Because the truth must be alive. It is a living spiritual law. A living experience discovery of something that actually happens. That something that which happens to the individual himself. <coughs> I have coached and guided a number of operating alchemists in the course of years, trying to show them and help them in their own search for the various elements and metals of the stone. And usually, I'm happy to report that after a certain degree of careful guidance without interference, each one comes and says, at last, I think I begin to see what this is all about. I begin to realize that behind the experiment there is something else. And that in focusing upon this experiment to the performing of it, I am releasing an archetype. I am releasing out of myself a pattern conviction. And as one said to me, if I ever succeed in the experiment of the transmutation of base metals, it is because I have released the true formula from within myself. <laughs> but these formulas on paper are only catalysts, agents, to direct attention, just like a written book on philosophy does not make a philosophical item. 
but may cause the individual to become concerned with this matter and to begin the release of his own soul symbolism through his own nature. Now this soul symbolism will carry the alchemist part way because as he becomes more and more sensitive and more and more proficient, he is releasing from himself the complete chemical terms, the complete story of his own growth. He is telling us in the terms of metals and elements and bottles where he came from and how he got as far as he has. He is telling the story of his own growth, or rather the growth of his own soul from the germ within himself. From his own seed to its own final point of attainment. But at, in every instance, there comes a time when the alchemist catches up with his own soul symbolism. Remember, he has not made the soul. That is, he has not perfected the soul within himself. Therefore, he cannot complete his own formula. In some cases, the alchemist catches up to the degree of his own psychic revelation through alchemy in a year or two years of research. In some, it will take him 10 or 20 years to catch up, depending upon the amount of internal chemical symbolism he can release from his own psyche. Because his psyche is then only telling the story of itself under the symbolism of the art of chemistry. It chooses that vehicle because the alchemist has studied chemistry, because it has become the natural channel for the expression of his own internal. If that same artist had studied painting, then the psychic nature would come through in color line and composition. But it comes through the chemistry to the chemist and to the individual who has accepted the psychological challenge of chemistry as the key to universals. So the time comes when the alchemist catches up to himself and he's stopped. He cannot carry the, the experiment any further because he has gone no further. Then he comes to the point where recapitulation or the old cycles of augmentation cease, and he stands in the presence of a new work. Now we find this not only in the case of alchemy, but we find it in the case of living. You'll find it in public schools. You will find that with each school child, there will come the point where that child has reached as far as its own soul recapitulation will permit. From that time on, the education of that child becomes increasingly difficult. And under certain racial limitations and so forth, that will, our educational advancement usually ceases. The individual can't go any further because he has gone as far as he could. More correctly, he has gone as far as he has ever gone. And that means that from there on, life becomes new growth rather than recapitulation. And this is a much slower and more difficult problem. In alchemy, at this stage in the uh, problem, the chemist becomes the hopelessly confused one who prays for assistance and guidance. And it is in these emergencies, if they are the genuine emergencies due to the individual having actually exhausted his own potential, and therefore justly caught up to himself. Then it is that, uh, as in the alchemical legend, alas, the artist appears, the ad himself. The individual, having exhausted the content of his own psychic nature, must then begin original growth. And he does this not by continuing dependence upon the psychic nature, but by drawing upon the archetype. He has to go on into his own creativity. Therefore, alas, the artist appears, which is the, the adept self, a symbol of consciousness coming to the assistance of the mind. And um, this cannot happen until the psychic load has been exhausted. Because until it is exhausted, it stands between the individual and any further growth. But when the negative part of the soul has been disproved and cast aside by art, and the positive achievements of the psyche have been released to their fullest extent, the individual is then caught with himself totally, as far as a psychic being is concerned. 
Then on the out, outside symbolism, the old master comes and tells him what to do. On the inner of psychic symbolism, he begins to draw upon archetype or upon new work. Then he receives the new design or the new symbol which must carry him to the next degree. From that time on, instead of being built by soul, he begins to build soul. Because each individual is built by his soul to the degree that that soul has gone. And this has to be revitalized in each life. But having gone as far as his internal life has already proceeded, then it is necessary for him to begin new growth. A new growth calls upon a higher level than the psyche for its expression. New growth calls upon the archetypal source of life in the conscious basis of life. Therefore, the old teacher or the master becomes the archetypal impulse from the unconscious, which then must continue to build the soul, and can do so because the soul itself is no longer a conscious or integrated interference. The prejudice, conceits, opinions, theories, notions, beliefs, attitudes, all these things which have disfigured the soul have now been done away with by alchemy, by transmutation. The good parts of the soul have been fortified until the soul becomes, as far as possible, the wise teacher, as far as that lesson can be learned. Then the intercession comes from a superior archetypal self, for the soul must then turn in its turn for guidance to that which is superior to its own nature. So the old teacher comes as the impression of the purpose and the plan itself from the most internal, <coughs> internal parts of consciousness. And this becomes then the guiding principle to the alchemist from that point on. He then continues his positive growth. This is, again, participation in the universal consciousness which then becomes his instructor. Man teaches himself from within himself as far as he can go, then the universal consciousness takes over. And the universal consciousness then assists the individual to continue his growth as far as possible, and continues to do so life after life until the universal life itself is released. <coughs> So we have two distinct types of teaching, or three in fact. We have man learning from the book, which is learning from the tradition and from the environmental world around him, the book and the laboratory. We have him learning from the inspirations of his own soul, and having achieved this level and consummated it, we then have his direct participation in the creative power of consciousness of life. And by means of this, consciousness then is gradually transformed into further soul power and it continues to build the soul itself until the soul becomes a vehicle or instrument sufficiently perfect, and sufficiently complete, like a body, that it can be unsold or can receive into itself uh, the uh, consciousness, the personal consciousness of the individual. And by so doing, then the person becomes a living soul and has the adept experience or the adept life. And he achieved the great work. And having transformed itself from a creature of the material world to a creature of the psychic world or the world of soul. Now this does not mean that the adept necessarily disappears from humanity. But it means that his level of life within himself is on the level of enlightened soul rather than on the level of externals. That he is the master of his destiny and the captain of his soul. And that at any time he so wills, he may experience his own adept existence. Because an adept, according to alchemy, is not one all the time. He is only an adept when he wills to be one. He is only an adept when the consciousness <coughs> is required. Otherwise, he lives a very simple and normal life, a quiet life, like Elias Autista, who was unknown. But uh, the adept has available the immediate contact with internals, 
and is therefore in a position to call upon faculties superior to those of the average person when the need arises. This is the alchemical approach to it. But I think it is very interesting and important to realize that the chemist reaches the point where he cannot go on without calling upon archetype. And in this he begins his new work of proceeding as a creating chemist. And finally, through the acceptance of chemistry as a spiritual mystery of religion, and the practice of chemistry as a completely devotional art and science, the alchemist experiences the mystery of the metals. He experiences the universe as the great chemical mystery. And having so experienced it, becomes master of the elements and patterns of this chemistry. Well, our time is up, so we'll have to continue next week. We have spoken of the adept in alchemy as being the child of the sun and moon. So that we have a basic triad established here of the sun, the moon, and the master. A triad which occurs in many esoteric systems. We know that the sun represents in alchemy the spiritual source or father of all things. The moon, the mysterious mother, or the mother of mysteries, great Diana, goddess of the Ephesians. We know therefore that heaven and earth, or God and nature, father and mother, son and moon, generate the father of the child in conformity with the concept of the 47th proposition of Euclid. If therefore the other is the child of the sun and moon, we know rather well the symbolism and the place would be occupied in the trying nature of man as he was studied and considered by ancient philosophy. We know that each spirit and matter, through their minglings and blending, produce the mysterious power which the Greeks term the soul. That the adept is therefore the diamond soul, as in the symbolism of Northern Buddhism. That he represents the power of the soul as the great transmuting agent in the universe. What then is the alchemical concept of soul? How are we to understand it? And how does this understanding differ from the more popular systems that we know today? It is obvious to the students of the medic arts, the soul represents a compound, that it represents the combining or uniting of two qualities in themselves not to be combined or united except through some catalyzing agent. Spirit and matter in themselves are not easily brought into a compound. So the alchemist is told that the secret of his art is to make fire burn in water, and that water must feed the flame. Now we realize now in a way that fire and water now play the part of the king and queen or the heaven and earth. And that fire must be sustained by water, yet in our common experience, water extinguishes fire. So we are dealing not with the crude and rude elements that we know, but with certain mystical symbols, allegories based in chemistry, but extending far beyond our normal chemical speculations. 
the soul being a compound is combining two forces or two principles or two qualities. It represents a union of archetype and matter to produce what we call form. Therefore, within the pattern of soul lies the concept of the world form. For form must always be a compound. Form contains a compound of life and matter. <coughs> it is life brought into organization through matter. It is life implanting itself or impressing itself as what Bernie calls the signatura realum, upon the face of matter. Whenever life builds its forms and bodies, we have this formal principle. Bodies composed of matter bound together by life and formed as an installed matter. It is a compound of life and substance. Thus the soul has a dual nature, part of its nature representing an extension downward from the sphere of life or consciousness, and part of its nature being an extension upward from the world of bodies, from the world of matter. Thus in the great uh, apocryphal book of Enoch, we hear the story of the sons of heaven descending to the daughters of men and taking them for wives, and the progeny were giants, and there were giants upon the earth in those days. Now the sons of God and the daughters of men are again spirits and bodies. The union of the principle of life brought into identity with the principle of matter. And these two combining to create organizations, organisms, compound creatures. And of this compounding, the most basic, according to the Greek, was this compound which is called the soul. Either the world soul, which is the compound of heaven and earth, or the human soul, which is the compound of consciousness and matter. In alchemy, therefore, the soul becomes the great laboratory within which the experimentation takes place. And the problem in regeneration in alchemy is to solve the mystery of the soul, to transform its present state into that of the diamond or adept soul. The soul we recognize as containing within it two essential elements. One, the emotional or psychic nature, the other, the mental or rational nature. We know that reason and emotion represent the sum and mood on the level of the soul. And that these two again must unite to produce a new instrument or a new being, which we have mentioned already and as said was the alchemical homunculus or the artificially created being. We have also learned that in the development of the nature of soul in alchemy, the soul becomes the instrument of function upon a level of being which is infinitely more subtle and refined than that of our objective life. To the alchemist, therefore, the mystery of the soul, its creation, its unfoldment, its development, was, uh, this mystery was carefully concealed under a series of chemical formulas. And each disciple was expected and presumed to be able ultimately to solve these formulas. Each was a reader to which he must give his own internal meditation. It was a symbol upon which he must contemplate and through which he must release his own instinctive apperception. 
of these mysteries of life. <coughs> then let us try to analyze the processes creating the soul. And while man peculiarly endowed with this instrument has a destiny unique among the created things of the earth and of nature. <coughs> To understand this, we must borrow something from the later Egyptian religion. That phase of it is developed under the street burials of Egypt, the Ptolemies, where the mysteries and rituals of the earlier religion were brought under certain philosophical disciplines from Greece and thereby made more intelligible to us. In the Egyptian mystery, the soul was a secondary structure consisting of seven essential internal ingredients. These in themselves, the Egyptians call the seven souls. <coughs> and to each of these souls was given one of the great psychic behavior problems of human experience and consciousness. Man's soul was born with him. But he had what might be termed his milk soul or his infant soul that had one duty to perform. Later, this soul gave way to a second. More correctly, the soul itself unfolded and became a second kind of soul which had to do with the extension and expansion of his body and the principle of growth, the unfoldment from within himself, the extension of his cycle nervous system throughout the fabric of his body, the gradual control of body by the power within it. Later, this gave way to the third soul, which was the generative soul, which taking hold at puberty or adolescence began the process of setting into motion the great reproductive power of soul energy. And so it proceeded step by step to these and other forms until it finally came to the adept soul or the highest part of man's psychical life. And this soul also, having absorbed the other six, became the sovereign and complete ruler of all the individual. And if this soul was protected during life, this individual then had a consciousness after death and received a conscious place in immortality. This then was not the soul that finished and must die, but the soul that could go on to the abode of the gods in the blessed lands of Amenta. So the soul of man was something he had to earn something he had to create or build by his own activities. And this soul manifested to him through the unfoldment of his own inner life. The maturing of his soul was his great work. And having reached the maturity of the body, growth must go on. And the person in the body must grow, must unfold its own potential and achieve its own complete identity. When it did so, the soul then became, more or less, the vehicle of the self, and the individual stepping across from body took up his natural and proper abode within the structure of his own soul. He was then what the Egyptians called a blessed soul, one established in the last thing. And having achieved then to the adept state, in a way, this is the same concept that underlies the concept of the Hindu Mahatma. For Mahatma simply means great soul. A being in whom this internal power has accomplished its transmutation or its wonderful work. In Christianity, the Messianic soul is represented by the avatar or the system. And this is the Christ in you, which is the hope of glory, in which if it be lifted up, will raise all things unto it. Thus, the death and resurrection of the Messiah represents the soul cycle, 
or the death and resurrection of the life or the life. Or as it would be termed in alchemy, the death and restoration of the man. The soul then becomes the seed or theater of the great regenerative power of man. And it is composed by the release of these two polarized extremes of consciousness. One of the releases is achieved from below by the building of what we call the personality. And the personality, when properly and naturally matured, makes its positive contribution to the psychic and soul life of the individual. Through the real building and integration of the personality, we achieve, therefore, one of the essential elements of the soul. We become masters of the working of salt. For salt represents, in alchemy, uh, the power of experience, or the growth of man from below upward. The growth of his lower nature, we will say, the unfoldment of it toward the light of truth. Now the lower nature of man ascends gradually through the physical, through the emotional and mental life, until finally it reaches the apex of its own achievement on the level of reason. Therefore, from below upward, man builds gradually the rational power, the <coughs> rational faculties of his own nature. At the same time, the universality at the source of man builds downward, uh, creating step by step 